Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Mission to Mars Student Challenge out of school time staff training. We're really happy for you to join us this morning. And I think we have a pretty good program for you today. My name is Oda Lutz, and I work in the elementary and secondary education office at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And my colleague, Leslie Lowe's, who will be speaking with you momentarily, is in the informal education office. So our jobs are to get the cool math and science that we do at the laboratory out to folks like you so you can use it with our, our young people and get them excited about, about space and about science in general. So today we have disabled the chat feature, but the Q&A feature is what we will be using. So if you have questions, please uh, enter those in the Q&A. And one of my other colleagues, Amelia Chapman, will be monitoring those, answering the questions she can answer during uh, in the Q&A, or interrupting us and posing questions to us. And so feel free to ask a question anytime you have it, and we're happy to answer those questions. So the Mission to Mars Student Challenge is a cool thing that uh, we have going on. Um, but before we get into that, I want to learn a little bit about you folks. So I am launching a poll that you should be able to see, and it has three questions. So you may have to scroll down if your window is tiny. Uh, please tell us what grade levels uh, the youth are that you lead um, and what sort of program you're running this spring or summer. And then what your level of experience is delivering STEM activities. We, uh, we want to uh, make sure that we're um, adjusting our presentation on the fly so that we fit what you need. So we'll give that a, a couple of minutes. While you guys are answering the questions, I'll just say it's an honor to be here with you and help you inspire those great kids that I know you guys work with every day and are working so hard um, to adapt to the conditions that we're under these days. So um, if I could just really quickly, Oda, I'll just mention to everybody in the next hour, we'll talk about the Mars 2020 mission. We'll do a parachute design activity. So get your supplies after you do your poll. And then we'll show you um, highlights of, of the Mission to Mars student challenge. Um, if you get to stay a little bit longer than the hour, we're gonna do a bonus activity for you today. And that bonus activity, as you saw probably in the email that got you to this webinar today is called Soda Straw Rockets, but it's, uh, I like to call it straw rockets without a straw because lots of folks don't have straws at home <laughs> anymore. So uh, we try to do things in a way that doesn't, don't require special materials. All right, so looks like we have about 80% of our folks having responded. Oh, we're popping up pretty good here. Um, I'm gonna share the results here with y'all. So it looks like we have a good portion of our folks in the K-5 range and then a few more up in six, eight and nine, 12. Great, so that's a wonderful spread. Fortunate thing is for the Mission to Mars Challenge, we have something for everyone. Um, and all right, it looks like we have some folks doing some in-person programs. That's great. Um, and then for the online folks, we've done, as I mentioned, lots of adaptations for online learning. Um, and then that will work for both your in-person and online. So your hybrid system, your hybrid programs will work too. Um, I see we've got one person who's not doing a, a program this summer not, or this spring. That works. And looks like we have some uh, mid-level or even some high-level uh, experience delivering STEM activities. That's great. Um, for the person who's thinking about trying it, great. Uh, we try to make this stuff uh, doable for anyone. So you, don't not, you do not have to be a scientist or an engineer. Uh, you need to be able to wrangle kids, which you guys are all experts at and gather some common materials. So, all right, good deal. Thank you for participating in that poll. Um, we will get on with uh, the Mission to Mars Student Challenge. So the idea here is we're going to hopefully be equipping you to lead students in designing and building 
a mission to Mars. We have all sorts of resources that I'll walk you through later. Uh, the idea is that your students, if you're doing it this spring, will land their rover on Mars, quote on Mars, um, at the same time that uh, NASA is landing the Perseverance rover on Mars. So that will be landing February 18th. And our, our overall goals, we wanna get students involved in all 50 states and you know all over the world. Um, the good thing is we kind of kicked this off a few weeks ago with some early announcements and got folks signed up and we have over half a million students registered right now. So we're super excited about that. And we, uh, we do hope your, your students will uh, enjoy the program. We're really wanting to involve our underserved communities and that's just a, a, a heart passion of mine and of Leslie's, and it's a, a mission of the JPL Education Office. So we hope that uh, you'll find these resources usable with the underserved communities and not just usable, but things that they can really, really thrive with. And then of course, a uh, little bit of self-serving here, we're, we're landing on Mars and we want everybody to be involved in that. So a uh, little bit about the rover that is coming. Um, so Perseverance is the name of the rover and it was named by uh, a school child. And we are, as I mentioned, we're landing February 18th. Uh, I have a little video for you, a little trailer here. This shows you how Perseverance will land. All right, so that's kind of the super cool, exciting look of uh, the landing. Now that's an animation, so because we have not landed yet. So it's important uh, for younger kids especially to know there's no human on board this. This is just a robot. Um, I say just a robot, it's a super sophisticated robot. Um, and the way that you see it landing in the animation is exactly how we hope it will land on February 18th. We're gonna be coming screaming through the atmosphere of Mars really, really fast, pop out the parachute, do a retro rocket, and then land at about two miles an hour. So it's a, it's a really soft landing if everything goes well. So hope, hope that, whoops, that's starting again. Pardon my, uh, my flub there. So um, the thing about Mars is we are pretty sure that, um, well, we do know that there was water that flowed on Mars in the past. And if water was there, then we wonder if life was there. Um, so that's the big question we're after. Did Mars have life? Now we've flown a whole bunch of missions uh, since the seventies to Mars. It's a tough thing to land on Mars. Uh, overall, the success rate uh, between the US and other countries that have tried to land on Mars is about 50%. So it's always a nail biter when we're, when we're landing. But the drive to find out if Mars ever had life is so strong that we keep trying and we hope to increase our odds of landing as well. So we've had some recent successes we're very happy about and we hope Perseverance will also have a successful landing. So if you think about it, if Mars has life, that's super cool. And if it doesn't, that's also really interesting. Like why, why didn't it? So we don't know that Mars will have active life at this point. We're looking for past life. Um, and we're also not looking for the proverbial little green men. We are looking for, uh, for 
probably microbial life. Uh, the rover will be looking at rocks because Mars has a lot of rocks and some of them are sedimentary, meaning they formed in the presence of, of water or wind and could have trapped uh, samples of past life. And we're looking at bringing samples back someday. The, this mission is going to take samples, it's gonna find interesting rocks, take samples. And you can see in this image, these little sample tubes, those are gonna have little rock cores in them. And we're gonna leave them on the surface of Mars. And someday we hope to go back with another mission and retrieve those, somehow get them back to Earth. But that we do not have the technology for yet. So someday we, we hope, and hopefully your, your students might be part of the team that helps us figure out how to do that. Um, as I mentioned, not looking for little green men, looking for uh, signs of life. We call those biosignatures. So they are object substances or patterns that only life-based processes can create. So that's, it might be a little bit of a reach for your little kids to understand that, but just make sure they understand we're not, we're not looking for the, the family dog out on Mars. We uh, selected Jezero Crater. And when I say we, I mean the scientific community across around the world. Jezero Crater has uh, an ancient Delta, which is where water flowed. So there are some really old rocks and some really different minerals. Um, if you look at the picture, you see all these different colors. That's not what it looks like. If you and I were hovering over Jezero Crater, it would be brownish red. Um, those colors in this, that's called false color, and those highlight the mineral differences. So you can see there's lots of different minerals there. So it's a really interesting place to go, to go look. So some of those minerals are commonly associated with life on Earth. So that's why it's especially interesting to go to Jezero Crater. So uh, you may have heard of Curiosity Rover, which uh, landed back in 2012 and is still operating on the surface of Mars. Perseverance is going to look a lot like Curiosity. And per Perseverance is on the right here. You'll see the title says Mars 2020. That's what we call the mission and the rover is Perseverance. Uh, but we, uh, in the last several years, have come up with some cool new tools. Uh, so Perseverance is, a, is a, a pretty souped up rover. It has 23 cameras, which is insane. You can see that big, long robotic arm in the front. It's a lot like Curiosity's, but it's got different experiments on it. Um, we have a laser that is a little different than the, the laser on Curiosity, but it will check out rocks from a distance. Basically, we can zap rocks and uh, look at the spectral signatures of, the, of the, the dust and the plasma that's produced from the laser zap. And then we have, a, you can see the little cameras uh, up front. Those give us some, some stereo vision, which is kind of cool. Uh, new to our experience on a rover, we have some microphones that we hope will work for us and we'll be able to hear the laser make its noise. We'll be able to hear the sounds of Mars and it's not gonna sound, things on Mars are not gonna sound like they do here on Earth because the atmosphere is really thin. Uh, and Leslie will talk a bit about that later. So I mentioned the robotic arm. It has uh, a scoop so it can scoop up dirt and it has uh, a drill and it can not only drill into the rocks and scoop up the dirt, but it can analyze those samples. It has this cool chemistry lab on board. So for those of you with uh, middle school and especially high school students, um, wanna check out Sherlock and Pixel. Those are rock analyzers that are crazy levels of, of chemistry and um, and some cool magnification. So check those out. Um, the core sampling system is kind of on the belly of the rover. It's hard to tell in this image what's going on, but it's, a, it's an extra little robotic arm. You can kind of see that uh, little V-shaped upside down V. That's, a, that's an extra little robotic arm that is involved in uh, collecting and storing the samples. 
We're also we also have a, a technology demonstrator on board called Moxie, which is is it it works on Earth, and we're going to see if it, how it works on Mars. Mars atmosphere has a lot of carbon dioxide, and oxygen is really useful to humans. So someday we plan to send humans. So we'd like to have some oxygen to breathe. So we're going to see if we can make oxygen out of Mars atmosphere. Also. For that sample return mission I mentioned, we're gonna need some rocket fuel to blast off from Mars. If we have to take it from Earth, that's a whole extra mass that we have to take and carry and then use it when we get there. If we could manufacture rocket fuel on the surface of Mars, that would be cool. And oxygen is an, is an oxidizer, which it makes it really useful in burning fuel. All right, we also have on board another technology demonstrator. We have the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. We're gonna try to fly on Mars. How cool is that? So it's being carried on the rover in the belly. The rover will drop it, well, set it down, <laughs> and um, back out. We'll fire up the uh, propellers, the rotors. And with some luck, our first test, we're just barely gonna lift off the ground, just a few meters and then back down. If that works, we're all gonna be so excited and they're gonna try more, uh, more flights. So each flight will be of additional complexity. If we're lucky, we'll get some pictures from the copter, but the helicopter is just a technology demonstration. It's not, if we get pictures, that's like bonus. Uh, if we get off the ground more than once, that's a bonus. <laughs> so uh, it's gonna be super cool because I mean, can you imagine uh, being able to fly on Mars? And I'm apparently still having trouble advancing my slides. There we go. Um, so super cool stuff going on on the Mars 2020 mission. And these are the, the goals of the, uh, of the mission. Um, taking a look again at that Jezero crater, which is a really cool landing site, looking for signs of ancient life. Um, again, collecting and storing those uh, rock and soil samples. And then with the, the MOXIE instrument, trying to see if there is a, a way to produce oxygen and, in, and also just learning more about the history of Mars. So lots of cool stuff. And now you have uh, kind of the background that you need to know to teach some of this stuff. And I know I went through that kind of fast. The good news is this is recorded so you could go back and look at it. And we're gonna try to post some of these slides for you as well. So Leslie, I uh, believe you have some cool uh, STEM enrichment activities for these folks. Yeah, exactly. Um, now that Otis told us about this wonderful, amazing mission that's taken so much uh, perseverance and ingenuity to pull off by our engineers, we want to bring your, your kids along with it. And um, we think it's really important to bring creativity of all kinds to, um, to what we do. And so um, your kids with different talents, um, different ideas, different levels of being ready to learn. We want them at the table. And I want to show you one of the activities we have that I think is going to excite them and get them thinking about different ways that we do the exploration. Um, the basic idea of the activity that we're going to do now, the parachute design, is of course, as you saw in the video, that Mars 2020 is landing is going to be primarily abled, uh, enabled by a parachute. And so we couldn't do it without it. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to learn about today in this activity. I hope you guys have got out your supplies um, that were listed. We've got string, we've got our parachute um, and scissors and tape. I hope you're all ready for that and are cutting your screens because we're going to walk through that together today. Um, but let me just tell you first, in general, the kinds of things that we that we want to do for kids that aren't in the classroom, whether it be at home, whether you're doing it in an after school program, whether you're doing a camp, um, 
we, we just need you and the kids to be excited and be creative and thinking and, you know, get engaged in this. Um, we do things with our activities that we're offering um, aren't just to sit. Um, we want them up and moving and active and doing things. Um, you got to want to learn something, of course. And uh, most importantly, especially these days, is we design these so that you can do things either off the shelf or, or things you already have around the house. So um, we want to make them real adaptable so that you can do them virtually. You don't have to provide the, the kids with kits necessarily. Um, they can just find them right there. And um, of course, most importantly of everything that we do is uh, safety considerations. You know, we don't want to put anybody um, in a situation that uh, could could present a hazard. So of course, uh, dropping parachutes, uh, we need to be really careful about that. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. So um, let's do the activity. Um, I hope you guys have by your side, like I said, your um, the canopy that you're going to use for your parachute material, um, the payload that you're going to lower underneath your parachute. Um, in this case, I'm using um, paper clips that we're going to put together with the rubber band, and then also um, um, any of the lines in this case, four pieces of string that we're gonna to use to connect to it. So I hope you get that ready. I'm gonna walk through it with you really quick. But first, let me talk about a couple of um, concepts here. Um, so if you think about it, why does a parachute work? Um, what keeps it afloat? Um, there's, there's opposing forces, right? There's the force that um, wants to make the parachute fall, and then there's the force that wants to keep it from falling. And uh, I'm sure you guys are aware that what makes things fall is gravity. So we've got one force acting on the parachute and the payload, and we have another, um, the resistance of the air at that the payload that the parachute is feeling um, counteracting that. So um, those are the two forces that we're going to be working with here. Um, let me now um, walk you through on the next slide the engineering um, engineering design practice process. Um, we're going to use this as our framework for what we're going to do in this activity today. Um, and the nice thing is you can um, use this framework for guiding your kids. You don't have to know the answers. The whole point here is to um, identify a problem, brainstorm the solutions that you might be able to do, um, pick one of those designs that you think is optimal, the best one, um, build a model of that design, and then test it and evaluate it and see if it uh, worked with to um, the satisfaction of what you were trying to do um, in your problem. You can share those results out. Um, that helps the rest of the community who might be working on the similar problem. Um, and then um, make any changes you need to and build that again. So um, all you need to know is that you're going to think about your solution once you've identified the problem. And um, then we're going to design and build it. So first, of course, we have to have a problem. When you're landing on Mars or when you're doing this activity, there are different considerations you can take into mind. So it could be that you want it to stay afloat as long as possible. It could be that you just want it to land on the surface very safely and gently. Um, it could be that you want to design it so that it can carry a really big payload um, without without going down too fast or um, without um, you know, staying up for just a short period of time. Uh, you might wanna consider how quickly can the parachute actually open. So there's a lot of different um, things that you could do with this in identifying the problem. So what we're gonna do today is go for hang time. So in other words, um, 
can it, how long can it actually stay um, before it hits the ground from a designated um, height? All right, um, on the next slide, um, I want to go ahead and uh, have you guys, you may have brainstormed your solutions already when you came up with one of the supplies um, that um, we suggested before the activity. So whether it be um, paper towel, newspaper, um, pair, uh, material, fabric, um, you may already have made that um, type of design about the shape, the size, um, and the payload that you want to actually um, carry underneath it. Um, we're going to demonstrate a particular uh, design today, like I said, out of our uh, paper towel. And we're going to make our payload be a set of paper clips tied together with the rubber band. And then our lines are going to be just regular everyday string, but it could be dental floss. Um, it could be um, other things you can find around the house that are uh, easy to make. And then we'll put it together. So I'll walk you through that really quick, super easy to do. Um, in this particular design, we are just going to have our four strings of identical length. And as it turns out, I've the length that I've chosen is going to be here, um, the same as the side of, of uh, my canopy here. And you just take your tape and apply it to one end of each one of these to the edge of your canopy so that it will stay connected. I'm not gonna walk through the whole thing with you because um, I'm gonna show you some results, but we wanna secure that to each of our corners. And then what we'll do is secure, once we've completed that, we're going to secure each end to our payload. In this case, what I did was tie it to the end of the paper clips that are tied together. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute to do that. Um, so we can do this build supplies, you know, maybe just one minute and then um, we'll come back and do a test. We'll go on to the next, uh, the next step in the engineering design process once you guys have had it built. Now, um, I invite you to ask any questions in the Q&A at this point in time to find out uh, if there's any ideas that you might want to share or if there is questions that you have about what we've covered so far. So I'll give you a minute just to do some taping and um, we'll, we'll come right back. Is there anything you wanna share while we're doing this, Oda? Yeah, so Leslie, I noticed in the picture that you posted, you had a hole punch and uh -huh. we didn't, you know, we didn't, we didn't ask people to get hole punches because right. not everybody has one lying around. Is there any advantage to using a hole punch instead of just taping it onto the corner? That's a really good, that's a really good point. So, of course, we were talking about forces, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of force of the air underneath your canopy that's go and there's going to be gravity pulling on your payload. And so there are places where you might have weaknesses um, in your design. You want to make sure that you don't have any blowouts. <laughs> You don't want your parachute to rip. You don't want the, your payload to be able to disconnect um, and come apart. You want it to stay controlled on the way down. You don't want uh, spinning or um, being out of balance so that you can't correct. So it's really important to make a really good connection um, and tape may or may not be strong enough. So if you have the, a hole punch, you can reinforce, put the hole there, reinforce it, and uh, actually tie the string rather than simply taping it. So I don't actually have a hole punch at home. Could I just poke a hole with a pencil? like a You pencil? sure could. That would work real nice. All right. Um, okay. 
And like I said, if you want to reinforce the edge, it's hard to see here on the camera, but um, I put tape here um, around the hole so that it doesn't tear. Because we it. need our parachute to be able to put up with all those forces it's going to undergo. Cool. Okay. Okay. I'm going to assume then that uh, you guys have been able to put this together. And um, like I said, feel free to answer, ask any, any questions about it. So now what we're going to do is move to the next phase of the engineering design process. We're going to test our build and then evaluate it. So Oda, um, if you can stop sharing just for one minute. Um, uh, we're going to do a little demonstration here. And um, I'm going to show you first a drop so that you can see it in my little um, uh, studio here, how this is going to actually open. I'm holding it by the very middle. And I'm just going to pinch, unpinch it, drop my fingers, and you will be able to see that it's actually opening. And um, descending on its own. That happened pretty fast, but it did happen. Now I invite you guys also then to, I'm gonna hold it at a higher level so that you can actually um, watch it descend a little longer. And this would be the thing that you would want to use as your um, test, a full on drop and time, how long it takes from the time that you uh, let it go to the time that it hits the floor. Okay, we're gonna try this. One, two, three, there we go. And um, you can try this um, and try to get the best time and we'll see which one ends up working the best. Now, uh, uh, one thing that I should talk about is uh, the evaluation part. So did it, whose design, say if you're doing a little competition within your students, whose design um, did end up staying up the very longest? Um, everybody's dropping from the same height. Um, then uh, you can have the kids talk together about why they think that particular design worked better, better than the others and do a little bit of brainstorming there. Um, then you can decide what should we change? Um, for example, doing identical design with, this is just a trash bag um, that I'm using for my canopy here. So one thing we could do is say, hmm, maybe the air went um, through the napkin too much perhaps. And so we're, we're gonna try something that might be a little more solid and maybe that'll help keep things up longer. That's our experiment. One thing I want you to consider is that um, you don't wanna change more than one thing at a time because then uh, you won't know what exactly caused it. In engineering, that's called a control um, and, and then a variable. So you hold everything the same under control um, and then um, you change one thing, that's your variable. And that way you know what caused the change in your design. So I'm gonna just here, see how, whoops, <laughs> out of camera range. I'm going to show you how this particular one drops. That seemed to me go down a little bit faster. So maybe that's not the design that we want. Um, another alternative as a fun payload is have everybody use the same parachute design but try different payloads. So for example, here, this is a tomato container um, that we've attached. And um, we, we can see with the same parachute design for all the kids, what the different weights and sizes of payloads, how they perform. So I'm gonna try this. I think we'll find out pretty quick because it's much heavier than the paper clips that it drops a lot more quickly. Okay. All right. Um, any questions about that? Be sure and pop them in uh, to the to the Q and A. Now, in real life, um, some testing doesn't go as expected. Uh, it's better that it happens while you're testing and designing, um, rather than when you're actually 
in space trying to do the thing that you want to do, which in our case is land safely on Mars. So one thing I want you guys to understand with your kids is failure is a learning opportunity. I don't even like to use the word failure. It's just a trial that didn't give you the result that you expected. So um, that means you have to come up with a different design and try again. It's really a learning opportunity. And that's how we do it um, here at JPL2. You'll see on the slide, there's some pictures of um, one of the failures that we had on testing, in this case, the Mars Science Lab um, um, uh, parachutes. And uh, up there in the upper left, we have um, a picture of the shredding of um, the canopy when it was tested um, early on in the design, we put it in a big wind tunnel um, here on Earth and uh, try to simulate the force of the air that it's going to be on Mars and then um, see how it performs. So that was quite disappointing. And the engineers had to figure out what the heck went wrong with that. And um, they had to redesign it. They had to rethink about how actually to open it. And because that ended up being the problem, how it came out of its case. And um, then they redesigned it, retest it, and voila, they finally had a solution. Um, another way that we test these kinds of things in, in real life is to um, take a rocket up high in the atmosphere that has the parachute uh, deployed where the atmosphere is kind of like on Earth, it's kind of like what it's like on Mars. And uh, we had a lot of similar tests on that now here for the Mars 2020 uh, rocket launch. So let me tell you really quickly, and then I'll move on, um, about the um, atmosphere. There's a difference in the atmosphere on Earth and on Mars. Um, it's a lot thinner as on Mars, as Otis said, it's about a hundred times less dense. So what's keeping the parachute afloat um, is the pressure of the air. But if there's only a hundred times less air, it's gonna behave a lot differently. So that's why we have to test it in a different kind of environment than just um, in Earth's normal atmosphere. It's also colder, so that could affect your material different. Um, it's made of a different gas. Um, the Earth is primarily nitrogen with some oxygen, and Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. That's going to be a different factor on um, how the materials that you select use. Um, just real quick, a couple of fun facts, and I'll turn it back over to Oda. To our eyes, um, on Mars, the sky would be hazy and red because there's a lot of suspended dust in the air um, from the Martian soil, which is a red color on the surface. Um, it wouldn't look like the blue tint. And I'm sure you've seen that in some of the pictures. And a fun fact, um, if you were to stand on the surface of Mars on the equator at noon on a typical day in the summer, it'd feel like spring at your feet. So about 75 degrees. And by the time you got up to the top of your head, it'd feel like winter. It would be freezing on your face. So that would be some outfit you'd have to wear to, to adapt to those different um, environments. So Mars is a much different place. And Leslie, you mentioned safety is a, a really important thing when the students are doing the parachute drop. And for uh, shorter kids, or if you're doing this inside, um, you might want to have them do an underhanded parachute toss. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, what you could do is have the kids pitch it like an underhanded softball pitch. For those of you who may not be familiar, just hold, hold your uh, parachute in like we did before, but um, hold it down by your side and swing it back. We've got a picture of this in earlier in the slides and then swing it forward and let go um, just as if you were tossing a ball like that. And it will, you'll utilize a higher space and it'll float down really nicely. Very good. And Don, I see a question uh, in the Q&A about whether we will send you these slides. Yes, we will uh, get you those slides. All right, so 
back to the uh, Mars Student Challenge. Um, we're wanting to help you bring Mars into your after school or out of school time programs. Um, I mentioned that we have a lot of resources for you. So um, we have a five week education plan and it's broken up into grade levels, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. We also have a weekly newsletter that has some uh, tips and tricks for uh, instruction and also uh, recorded uh, discussion with a Mars engineer or scientist about the mission phase of the week. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. And then also an opportunity to participate in some Q and A's with NASA experts. So our activities, uh, as I mentioned, five week plan. And we have some, for those of you who are teaching uh, remotely right now, we have uh, at home versions or tips and tricks for doing these at home. Our first week, which is this week, is Learn About Mars. And by the way, we, we started it this week. If you didn't start it this week, it's really okay. You could start it next week. I mean, you could start it in the summer. You could do it in the summer. It's, it's a program that will be suitable for any time. The reason we're starting this week is it's five weeks until we, NASA, land on Mars. Next week, you'll be planning your mission. Uh, the next week, you will be designing the spacecraft. The next week, launching your mission and then landing on Mars. So uh, we have some educator events. I think you saw the announcement for this. This is why you are here today, January 21st. Uh, and then February 6th, we have an educator showcase. If you happen to be doing the challenge between now and February 6th and would like to talk with other, other educators about how they implemented the challenge, this is for formal and informal educators you can uh, join us on February 6th at 10 o'clock in the morning Pacific time. The week of landing, we are gonna have four student events. Um, on February 16th, which is Tuesday, we will have a program for high school students, 45 minutes, and it'll be uh, a little overview of the mission. And then we will have, uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, these will be streamed over JPL Education YouTube and NASA television. Um, middle school students will be a couple hours later in the morning, same kind of routine, but just focusing on middle school students. The next morning we will do an elementary school version. And then on landing day, we will have a 30 minute program for everyone. So that will uh, that'll give everybody a chance to get excited on landing day. Uh, feel free to have your, your students join us for any of those and your the newsletter will have the links to the, the, the login for or the, the poll where we ask students to submit questions. Hey, Oda, this is Amelia. Uh, we have a question. Is the same five week plan offered to school day educators or is this only for out of school time educators? So we know we are not overlapping and doing the same activities. That's a really good question. It is being offered to school day educators and out of school time educators. There are lots of activities to choose from so there are so many things to choose from. There's really, it, it would be hard pressed to do them all. So I would suggest coordinating with your school time educators and picking who's gonna do what. Uh, it's, there are different ones that are, you'll, you'll see that some of them are a little more uh, academic and might fit better in the classroom, the formal classroom. Um, and maybe, maybe like the parachute one, maybe your formal educator just really doesn't wanna be throwing uh, parachutes around. <laughs> so maybe that would be better if you're out of school all the time. So I would suggest coordinating uh, because there are lots of options that I'll uh, show you here momentarily. Uh, so we're looking for you to share student work. Um, we will shortly have a share page that I'll show you where it'll be. But for now, um, we're, we're just hoping you're getting ramped up, but we want to see pictures of what your students are designing. Um, and we're uh, also wanting questions, as I mentioned, we'll do questions during the live events, um, but we will hope that you will send some questions in in advance because uh, we're gonna be sharing those on social media and on some of our, our live events as well. So I'm gonna take you now to the challenge. This is our, our short link, go.nasa.gov slash Mars dash challenge. And when you get there, you get this 
page. And at the top, you have the registration button, which hopefully you've all registered. Um, and then if you scroll down, you can navigate by these, uh, these buttons if you like, or we, I'll just scroll through today. Um, we have uh, our promotional video who, uh, we had Emily Calandrelli do our promotional video. Some of you might know her from the uh, Netflix series, uh, Emily's Wonder Lab. And then we have our key dates, which you can scroll through. Uh, it's about what, what events are gonna happen. We had our introductory webinar you can, that was held on January 14th. You could watch the replay of that if you'd like. We had a mission scientist talking and there are downloadable slides on that page for that talk. So you could use those uh, immediately. And there are all the different weeks coming up and the teacher showcase. And then eventually we get to landing week events for students and there are links to, to watch, watch on YouTube. We have a countdown to uh, landing, so you can count down with us. And then we get to the education plans. So the first one it defaults to is introduction, uh, as if you have not started the challenge. Um, and this is just kind of uh, looking through the, uh, the challenge and seeing what activities you might wanna do there. As I mentioned, that introductory webinar from January 14 is playable here. The, you can download the presentation slides and then you could read the newsletter if you happened to have missed that or misplaced it. Now for week one, which is this week, if you go back up here and click week one, this video to the left over here is a, I believe it's about four minutes. It's an interview with Dr. Mujige Cooper, who is one of our planetary protection engineers. And she talks about how we learn about Mars. And that's pretty cool. Uh, tips of the week, as I mentioned, just tips for, for learning and teaching. And then you see we have 21 lessons and activities to choose from for this week. So lots of stuff. So you gotta click to expand. And then if you like sorting by grade level, you can sort by grade level if you like. Um, but if you don't, and notice if I hit K2, it goes down to 19 lessons. If we go to three, five, there's 19 lessons. Go to six, eight, there's 14 lessons. And for nine, 12, there are 12 lessons. And some of these, we call them lessons and activities because some of them are videos. Some of these Mars in a minute will answer some of your uh, burning questions about Mars. And those are, are very, very short. You can see the time period that, is, uh, that the that videos take and also the grade levels. We, these are little cartoons, but they're sophisticated enough for older kids and simple enough for younger kids. Uh, we have an art activity where you'll, um, you can uh, look at imagery from Mars and then create your own image of Mars. Uh, we have a poetry lesson, a couple of poetry lessons. Um, and then exploring earth and space with art. And then for your high school chemistry buffs, we have modeling silicates and the chemistry of earth's crest, which is a, a, a pretty cool lesson. But uh, to give you an idea of um, what these look like, uh, I'll click over to art and the cosmic connection. Um, each of these lessons has, uh, we're aligned with next generation science standards and common core state standards for mathematics where applicable. So if your school is interested in your programs uh, aligning with standards, we've got them for you. Um, and some of our resources have Spanish references as well. So that's helpful for some of your uh, at home learners, I think. Um, and we have a materials list in this particular case, we have PowerPoint slides. Um, there's one, there's an Earth version and then there's a Mars version. So for this week, we'd look for you to do the Mars version. Um, some management tips with some uh, training videos. We have uh, recommendations for different grade levels because you're not gonna do this, even though this is a K-12 lesson, you're not gonna do it with uh, all, you're not gonna do it the same way with all grade levels. We give you some background in case you want to uh, learn a little bit about the background for the lesson. So in this case, it's an art lesson. I'm not an artist, so I I didn't know the things about, I didn't know about the elements of art. So this was helpful for me to read about the elements of art, shape, line, color, 
value texture. And then we give you some, some definitions. And again, this is all for teachers, for your educators to, to read. And then we give you procedures to go through with your students. And then the activity, you can do it with any sort of art activity, art, art uh, tools, you can use pencils, you can use crayons, you can get fancy and use pastels, whatever, whatever you like. Some suggestions for assessments, uh, some extensions and such. Uh, back up at the top, pardon the quick scrolling. For some of our lessons, we have a student version of it. So for your students who are learning at home, you're, you have this page for yourself, but you can send your students to the student project. So this is um, exploring earth and space with art and we have a Mars version. And this is actually a quiz. So you can have your students do the art project that is in the lesson and then come over here, refresh their memory on the elements of art and then scroll down and take the quiz. And as I mentioned, there's one with earth and there is one with art, with Mars. So you have to scroll down a little further for the Mars one. So that's kind of an example of our lessons. So back to the challenge, um, when we get to, I'm gonna click this back to all so we can see all of them. Week two, week two, as I mentioned, plan your mission, that's next week. Um, or if you're, you can also, by the way, you can scoop these together. So if you didn't start this week, you wanna start next week, great. Do, do learn about Mars and plan your mission together. It's, it's easy enough to do that. Um, we will be publishing our video this afternoon and our week two newsletter. Now this, uh, this section has a fewer lessons. We have six lessons and activities. And for the younger set, uh, we do have some more of the Mars in a Minute videos, but we have a, what tools would you take to Mars? And they get to circle, whether they'd take a magnifying glass or a drill. Uh, they get to decide if they want their robot to uh, be a lander or uh, whether they want it to, to be a, a driver of rover with wheels or with legs. Um, older students, um, when you get up, and when I say older, I mean like third grade and above, we have this great lesson called Mars Bound where they, it's a card game. And if you're, if you're doing it in person, it's pretty easy to do a card game in person. If you're doing it online, it's easier to do uh, a, a whole class game. And so we'll have some uh, tips on that lesson about how to do that. There's one about uh, determining how effective your, how effective solar power would be for your lesson, for your, for your mission. And then for your older students, uh, this is some great advanced algebra determining when we can launch to Mars. It's, uh, it's, it's great, great stuff. And then so on and so forth, I won't bore you with going through all this stuff, but if you go to uh, week three, design your spacecraft, we have 16 lessons and activities to choose from. And then the next week, launch your mission. Of course, that you can imagine has to do with rocketry. And for very young students, we do uh, a 10 gram rocket, uh, build a rocket with shapes. And for older students, we do uh, everything from straw rockets to stomp rockets. And then our week five, land on Mars, 11 lessons to choose from here. This is where the parachute lesson is. So you'll see parachute design. Um, and that's, that's designed for K2, but it can be used for older students, um, adapting things to older or to different grade levels than we have it defined by is completely acceptable. Uh, as I mentioned, we define the grade level by the standards it addresses. And you guys are super creative and you can totally adapt to other grade levels. So we have uh, make, an, make an astronaut lander and learning how we communicate from space. Um, and then for older students, there's a uh, building a relay and doing some coding. So we have, we have a bunch of coding activities for, uh, for the various grade levels. So that is the challenge. Um, and I have a, uh, a poll for you that I would like you to tell me um, what you think your youth will appreciate most about participating in the challenge. 
And you can select two or three of them here if you'd like. Um, we're interested in knowing what you think your students would find interesting about this. So if you would go ahead and, and read through those. Oda, while people are taking that poll, uh, Vanessa asked a question, which is in the answered file now. Okay. She says, right now we are totally virtual. Let's say we were going to have several posts throughout the week to challenge children to do the activities at home. Is it okay to link your videos to our Facebook page or do they have to be used in a Zoom setting? Oh, so you can use them in whatever ways make sense for your audience, but I thought you might want to add to that. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. Yes, please use anything you find in any way that works for you. If it works to post it on social media, great. If it works to download it and put it in your Google Drive, great. Uh, if, it, if it works to put it up on your virtual classroom, great. Just whatever works for you. Uh, we're trying to make this as easy and accessible as we can. So uh, we really want, we want you to be successful and want you to have all the tools that you need. So, so hopefully, uh, Hopefully that will uh, uh, help you out. Just do whatever you can with them and please adapt the lessons. We write them, you know how it is. You write a lesson or an activity and it's like how you imagine it to be. And then you start talking with a teacher and they have this other great idea of how they would do it. Totally do that thing. Please adjust what, you, what we've written to work for your students because you, you know your students best and that's really what we want. Uh, we want your students to have a good, a good experience. All right, so I'm gonna end our poll and share results. Looks like lots of folks um, are excited about doing a hands-on activity. Yeah, that's, we really like to do hands-on activities. That's, that's super fun. Um, and as you know, it's, it's a little tougher when you're virtual, but we hope we have uh, some good ideas for that. And um, yeah, it looks like there's lots of, of folks interested, their students will be interested in learning about another planet and uh, watching the landing of the spacecraft. Yes, yes, we will be linking to that. So cool, I'm very excited about that. All right. Um, and next, uh, another poll for you is how will you implement this challenge in your program if you think that you will? Do you see yourself maybe doing one activity or a series of activities or do you have a regular STEM enrichment period? Um, will you be doing the activities like now between now and February 18th when the mission lands or will you do it during the summer or later the school year? Um, is it something you feel that you could share with your colleagues? Um, and of course, if you're not sure yet, that's totally cool. <laughs> we're just kind of throwing this at you and we don't necessarily expect, you know, we, we're not looking for a commitment here. <laughs> we're, we're just wanting to know what, you, what you're thinking. Uh, so uh, we're, we're really happy with, with whatever your answer is. So it, this, again, it, it's not about being right or wrong. It's about telling us what you think you might be able to do with this. That, that gives us feedback um, on whether what we provided is, is suitable for you. Uh, so um, sharing results here, looks like uh, lots of you wanna do a series of the activities and uh, a couple of people are, are not sure or they'll do one activity, that's great. Um, and doing stuff before the landing is wonderful. If you do it later, that's wonderful too. Sharing with colleagues, also wonderful. So. Uh, we'll get this recording up as soon as possible so you can uh, you can share that way. Okay. Um, and I notice we are right at the hour. Uh, Leslie, would you like to talk about your boost cafe? Sure, just to let you guys know, um, maybe Amelia um, can maybe answer, we can ask a question. How do I learn more? And there's going to be two, two answers to that. <laughs> and uh, one of them is if you want to follow my blog, I write uh, twice a year on um, the Boost Cafe uh, about different things that are happening. And we always like to tie our activities into um, events that are going on, whether it might be something in the sky that's unusual to see or a big mission event 
Um, we think it adds a lot of life and gives NASA a reason for doing this um, when we connect it to things that are going on. And so twice a year, I'll um, be posting something there um, that really is targeted at what um, you, your needs are in the after school um, environment that we know is different from the classroom and so hopefully provide some inspiration. And then I'd like to turn it over quickly to Amelia to tell you about another resource um, that we'd love you guys to take advantage of. Great, thank you. So um, here at JPL, we run something called the Museum and Informal Education or My Alliance for all of NASA. And it's, as it says there, an active community of practice that provides informal educators with access to NASA resources. Everything NASA does is available and is available for free, but it also is very overwhelming in its volume. Uh, so the whole point of the My Alliance is that we are concierge service helping informal educators find what they really need. So you can see some of the things we offer there, you know, direct assistance, a member website, a calendar, collaborative chat, regular briefings, and a weekly newsletter. I will put the um, link in the chat. The public, the Museum and Informal Education Alliance site is um, somewhat available to the public where you can see the calendar, you can see things that the Alliance members are doing in your community. But if you want to um, unlock all the resources specifically for informal educators, you need to join. It is, of course, free and it is simple. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can email me at that address. And once again, this is designed for informal educators. Um, hopefully everyone on this call, that's what you are. <laughs> all right, thanks. Thanks, Amelia. And I just wanted to say really quickly, you know, this is a way to stay connected to um, not only what's going on at JPL with the Mars, but so many different things that NASA has going on. Um, and you'll be able to connect um, these resources. We hope to guide you through the ones that are going to make the most sense for you, because we know we know that NASA has a lot of stuff. <laughs> so thanks. All right, and thank you for joining us for the first hour. Uh, this You just received the bulk of the information from the webinar, and we know that you're really busy people. So if you need to to uh, head out and get on with your day, then please feel free to do so. If you would like to stay around for the uh, bonus activity, we are going to build straw rockets. And for the straw rockets activity, I asked you to find some scissors, a piece of paper, a pencil, whoops, a pencil and some tape. So, all right, Leslie's got hers, awesome. Now, um, this activity, I'm going to take you over and show you what the activity looks like. This is the, this is the student version. There's a student version and the teacher version. Um, there is a tutorial. Uh, in our, on our tutorials, we do subtitles in Spanish. So even though the, the speaking is in English, we have Spanish subtitles for your Spanish speaking students and families. Um, and we call it straw rockets because we used to make these with straws still can, but I didn't have a straw. So I decided to do it without a straw. All right, so um, you, and you can use a tape measure if you like, um, but for today we're, we're not gonna do measuring so I didn't have you bring one. There is a straw rocket template, as you can see. Um, this, uh, this straw rocket template is not necessary for uh, doing the activity. It is actually, uh, handy if you have an in-class uh, need, but if you don't have an in-class uh, need or you're, you're having them do it at home, then you can just do it with regular paper, okay? Um, so we'll keep scrolling down and um, I'm gonna, they, they say cut out the shape. Well, you don't have necessarily the, the thing to, to, to cut out. So. What I'm going to have you do is take your piece of paper and I just grabbed a piece of printer paper that was kind of bent um, and my printer doesn't like bent paper. So <laughs> it was going to be a scotch paper anyway. And there's a, a short side and a long side. Um, we're gonna have you cut parallel to the short side. And the way that you can make this work, let me see if I, uh, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing 
And then I'm gonna see if I can, uh, I'm, I'm actually gonna leave Leslie on the screen and see if she can uh, follow my instructions. Mm -hmm. So I want you to take three fingers and put them down on, on, the, on the side of your paper, the other way, Leslie. Um, so that turn your turn your paper horizontally so that the long ways. Thank you. There you go. So three fingers is about the width that I want your cut to be. So I want you to cut parallel, three fingers wide. If you teach younger students, then it might be four fingers wide. Okay. Uh, it's I it, it's not that important how wide it is. I mean, this isn't rocket science, right? Or maybe it is. Ha. Okay, so you should end up like, very good, Leslie. You have a strip of paper and then grab your pencil and lay your pencil lengthwise. Now, if your piece of paper is longer than your pencil, I want you to tear off the end so that your piece of paper is shorter than your pencil, just by a little bit or about the same length as your pencil. Now, I want you to roll this piece of paper around the pencil. So we're gonna roll it around and you might have to put it down on a, on a, on a uh, surface to roll it. But what you're doing is you're making a tube, okay? So just a, a quick little tube. And once you get that rolled like Leslie has it, we're gonna put a couple pieces of tape on there. So just don't tape it to the pencil, just tape it to itself, tape the paper to itself. And it doesn't have to be like super fancy, right? It can be lengthwise. Yeah, you can tape it lengthwise or you can tape it around. Either way, just make sure you don't catch the pencil. And it's always a good idea to have more tape than not enough. So when I do these, I like to seal the whole seam make sure there's not gonna be any leaks, okay? And when you get that all nice and taped up, the, uh, you wanna take one end of your tube and twist it, twist it tight, okay? And now this is making a nose cone and notice it doesn't need to be fancy, okay? And you can put a piece of tape on it to hold it and if twisting it is not your gig, that's okay. You can pinch and fold it over. Either way, you could just tape it up. The idea is to make sure that you have, um, you, you, you can uh, make sure that you have um, uh, a nose cone that is not going to leak, okay? All right, so you have this nice little uh, straw and now Leslie's already removed her pencil. So uh, go ahead and remove the pencil. And what you have here is the fuselage or the body of a rocket, okay? So Leslie, if you could hold that up for everyone to see, it'll be nice and beautiful, okay? All right, now the nose cone is the top of the rocket what we need on the bottom are some fins, okay? All the way at the bottom, we're gonna put some fins, but you're gonna leave the bottom of the rocket open. Now, you can make fins any way you want. You can do any kind of fins you like. What I do, and I will, uh, I will show you over here what I do. I take just a little piece of paper and I, I try to cut a square and you can use any, any bits of your paper that you like, how to cut a square. And then I cut two triangles out of it by uh, cutting a diagonal. And then I can attach these to the rocket any way I want. Now, my favorite way of doing it is folding them, folding them in half, kind of, let me get rid of my scissors, folding them in half so they look like that, and then running a piece of tape down the middle and taping them to my rocket. So um, Leslie's really good at this. This is why I keep having uh, her show you how to do this. So 
you can see really well with her background there that you can see the tape sticking out top and bottom. And then she's gonna stick that on the bottom of her fuselage. And then remember the tape needs to not cover the hole at the bottom. So maybe not all the way at the bottom. <laughs> Perfect, Leslie, you're doing a great job. And then, you know, you can, again, use more tape if you need to um, and use your scissors to adjust the tape if you need to, either way is fine. Uh, then we're gonna do the exact same thing with your other triangle. Remember you had two triangles? So fold that one and stick a piece of tape in the middle and you're going to tape that to the opposite side of the fuselage, still on the bottom, but just the opposite side. So a nice big piece of tape there and taping it on that, that center. And if you could move that to the middle, Leslie, that's, there you go. And then once you get that on there, try to make all the, the fins stick out kind of all the way around. Now, this is one way to make the fins. If you like to make fins differently, please have at it. In fact, the way that your rocket flies can be determined by your fins. So that's something you could change. You could change, you could make a rocket and then you could change the fins for the next design, okay? Now you've got a rocket, you need a launch vehicle. So you, or you need a, it is a launch vehicle. You need a, a propulsion system. So normally we would use a straw. We'd stick a straw in and we would blow. But if you don't have a straw, this is where you bring out your pencil again, okay? Bring out your pencil and your sheet of paper and do the three fingers thing again. Cut another piece of paper, just like you cut the fuselage out. So you're gonna get a thing that looks very similar to something you've already seen. All right. And again, grab your pencil and lay your pencil along the length. And again, if it's too, if, if your paper's too big, tear off the end. <laughs> now this time, I want you to wrap this, this uh, paper really tight, as tight as you possibly can. So definitely put it down on a desk and roll it up. And you're gonna get it as tight as you can on that pencil. And that might be a little tough, but this time you're not gonna tape it yet, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna hold that cylinder of paper tight and then slide the pencil out. And then you're gonna try to make it a little bit tighter. <laughs> <laughs> this is part is hard. It is a little hard, it is. And your younger students will have trouble with this. Their parents can help them. Or maybe they get lucky and they have a straw at home. If you reusable straws work, any kind of straw. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you roll it tighter. The reason you're rolling it tighter is so it'll fit inside your rocket. So what you need to do is double check that this, this is what you're rolling right now is your straw. You need to double check that it will fit inside your rocket. And Leslie's does, yay. So now Leslie can tape up her straw. She's gonna do the same thing as she did on the fuselage of the rocket. So tape it all the way along that, that seam. And then we will we'll have a straw. And this is where it's gonna get fun. And I realized that making the, the, the paper straw yourself adds a level of complexity, but it's a way to do an activity at home with students remotely who might not have all the materials. Mm -hmm. So if you can get straws, great. It's way easier. If you can't, it doesn't mean you can't do the activity. And I want to make sure you all understand that for any of our activities, our materials lists are suggestions. So when we were doing the parachute, we, we mentioned all these different options for the strings, right? String or dental floss or sewing thread or anything that looks like string. Uh, we want to make sure that, that folks know that it's, it's negotiable. All right, so Leslie's got her straw. She's putting it inside of her rocket. 
And now she's going to be able to launch by blowing through the straw. Go ahead, three, two, one. And it goes off screen because she made such a cool rocket. <laughs> I can't get to it now. <laughs> right, so it's gone, but you get the idea. And what we ask students to do is try this the first time. Some of them are gonna work, some of them aren't. Um, by the way, uh, the way that you blow through the straw is important. If you were the kid in class who knew how to do spitballs, you're gonna have no trouble launching these rockets, okay? You are, um, you're going to have uh, an opportunity to, to practice your spitball uh, finesse. <laughs> so instead of just going and being all gentle about it, you wanna do really fast. And then that'll give your rocket a nice propulsion. So that's what you wanna do for launching. And some students are gonna get it the first time. Some students won't, give them another chance. It's fine, just keep trying. The important thing is blowing really fast and quick. Uh, a common thing that goes wrong is they didn't get enough tape. So they have a leak somewhere in their rocket. So more tape is good. Um, and once they all get them flying, they're gonna, they're gonna be like super excited. Uh, again, safety is a big deal. Do, make sure that they know not to launch towards someone. If you're doing it in a class with a whole bunch of kids, have them all standing in a line on one side of the classroom and launching in the other side, toward the other side. If they're doing it at home, just caution them and their parents to make sure that younger uh, siblings or even older siblings or parents are out of the way so that they, they don't uh, hit anyone with uh, their rocket because it, it, uh, it could hurt them in the, if they hit them in the eye, it could hurt. So uh, be really careful with that. Yes, Leslie. One of the th things that um, I suggest that you have the kids do is take the rocket and mine's on the other side of the planet right now, so I can't go get it, but um, take the rocket um, before you put the straw on it and blow gently through the end. And then you can actually feel any air that might be leaking out of your rocket. This is another test um, that you can do before you actually do do the launch and you might have to go back and add extra tape. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, check check for leaks before we try to launch. Yeah, a really good one. And and then the next thing is uh, your your students will have extra paper, right? I mean, you probably did not use your entire piece of paper. What I see here are three more rockets. <laughs> <laughs> because if I did my, my, my three fingers, I would have three fingers, three fingers, three fingers, and I could do three more rockets. Um, and I'm tearing off the edge, so I have room, I have uh, paper left for my fins. I would ask students to design another rocket, make sure it fits over their straw, <laughs> and change the fins, or change, just change one thing. So if they wanna change the fins, great, make square fins, make round fins, make more fins, whatever, whatever works. Um, but if they don't want to change their fins, they really like their fins, then maybe change the length of the fuselage or the type of nose cone. But again, make sure that they're only changing one thing at a time. You change one variable. Um, so hopefully that's fun. Uh, kids always want to know how far their rocket launches. And if your students are good with rulers or need to practice their measurement, then get them using rulers or tape measures. If they're not, or if they're at home and they don't have a ruler at home, find anything. So have them start at one spot, launch their first rocket, uh, mark where they started, like the toes of their, of their feet, and then mark where the rocket landed, and then measure in between. Now they can use that, like I said, a ruler, or grab a shoe. Um, they, everybody's got a shoe laying around, grab a shoe. How many shoes did it go? Uh, if, they don't, if they don't wanna take off their shoe or they don't wanna use their shoe, then grab anything else. Grab their scissors. How many lengths of scissors did it, did it follow or did it fly? And make a note of that. If you're having them keep a science journal, that's great. Keep the, your notes in the science journal. And then try their second rocket and do the same thing measure, did it go better, did it go further, did it, did it perform better? And then try their third and their fourth. And then this is part of the engineering design process. You're trying different designs, you're refining based on your, uh, your findings. 
So maybe you tried a different kind of fin and it did really well. So now you wanna keep that fin and try something else. Great. Maybe your fins aren't working well. So ditch them <laughs> and do something different. Um, so the idea is try different designs and come up with the one that'll fly the furthest. So that's it for our straw rockets without a straw. Um, at this point, we'll take questions. If you have any questions, we're very happy to hear from you. Uh, Leslie, did you have any uh, other things to comment on here? Sure, I just wanted to um, say that I'm really glad that you guys are considering doing this for your kids. And um, I appreciate you coming to this training. I really hope that it has been something that um, is useful to you um, since we know that probably most of you don't have experience delivering actual um, STEM topics. Um, we were hoping that we have shown you things and that you'll find things throughout the challenge that you can just lead your students through um, guiding, but if they decide there's something they wanna research more or if they have questions you can't answer, um, you are welcome to go to the web and have them search um, for the answers, um, come up with ideas to solutions, browse our websites to try to find the right information. You don't have to have the answers, just look. And if you can't find the answers, maybe you've discovered something that um, a lot of other people need to know about too. And another thing that I would say is really important part of actually you know, getting into that mindset of an engineer or a scientist is um, helping the students be able to share um, what they learn. So um, that's an important part of what scientists and engineers do too. Um, so maybe you have your students um, talk about your rocket design, make sure if, if you're um, encouraging that within your class, you know, ask them to do um, a presentation about um, why they chose the particular design that they chose and what the results of their tests um, were. And then you can collectively brainstorm about, well, if we were going to design this together, what, what um, would we pick? What are the elements we saw out of the, um, all the different varieties that we chose that we think would have the best chance of success? Because that's how it works in the science and engineering community too. Yeah, thank you for that, Leslie. I, I really wanna echo what you said about uh, not needing to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. A lot of us grew up in, in school settings or whatever where we, we were pressured to have all the right answers. And if, it, if, you, if you didn't have the right answer, you were wrong. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily how engineering works. Um, we like to throw out lots of ideas um, and try different things. And I think it's really important and valuable when kids find out that maybe adults don't know everything. Because if, if a kid asks you a question and you happen to know the answer to every question they're asking, then they think that, you know, well, you know, they need to strive for having every answer to every question and they don't. Uh, we really want kids asking questions that we don't know the answer to, because then you can say, hey, you know what, I don't know, let's, uh, let's research that. How would you research that? And that's a really valuable tool for kids to acquire is how to research. Um, the internet is full of everything these days. Some of it's factual, some of it's not. So how as a, a, an adult even or a young person, do you know what's accurate and how do you research? How do you know what an what a, um, uh, accurate source is? So when you're looking at science things, if you look at, at the, the major research organizations, so big universities or uh, government agencies that are doing the research, you're, you're more likely to get a accurate answer than someone's opinion on a, on a, a news or a blog. Some of those opinions can be great, they're, they're fine too, but um, it's really valuable to help students uh, learn how to research and learn how to find answers to their questions. So please do take that as an opportunity to, uh, to not feel like you need to know everything and, 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 and adopt phrases like, I don't know, let's find out and engage students in learning together. Or I don't know, why don't you try it and let me know? Why don't you report back to the class? 
because those things are, are, are super important and they're empowering to your young people. And we want students to know that they can uh, learn and think on their own. So and that's part of the beauty of the after school space. Um, yeah. There you can do your enrichment activity and then you know talk about it a, a day or so later um, or work it right then in real time and you're able to follow the students' interests. Yep. So with that, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll stick around here for a couple more minutes and take any questions you happen to have. Um, if you have questions, you'll, you'll be receiving um, newsletters and we'll be sending you the link to the recording. Uh, feel free to uh, message us back and at any time and, and we'll answer your questions. So have a good afternoon and uh, thanks for joining you on us. Mars, yes. Yeah. See you on Mars, February 18th, we land, tune in. Bye-bye.